why would I choose to review Scott Snyder's Justice League? Well, first off, it's a run that I do deeply love. There's just so much passion in this book. In a sea of DC books that were just phoning it in, Snyder's Justice League is actually trying something new while also embracing its predecessors. But there's a lot of stuff to nitpick in this book. I mean, like, a lot. After, like, issue three, all logic just kind of flies out the fucking window in this book. But that doesn't stop me from loving it. So let's set the stage. Flashback to DC Rebirth when Brian Hitch took over Justice League. Now, if I was rebooting DC's flagship book, I'd maybe pick a different writer. But hey, you know, I'm not in charge. And Hitch did have experience as a Justice League writer. I mean, he wrote the JLA series where... <laughs> Batman said that he wanted to stop funding a hospital so that the criminal would go off life support and die? Yeah, it wasn't good. Hitch's first story in JLA was about an alien invading Earth and bringing destruction to everything. And it turns out that Hitch really, really likes this idea because he does it every fucking arc. If you needed to mass-produce doorstops, Hitch's Justice League would make a pretty great product. Hitch is his master of mass-producing filler arcs. It's not lazy, it's just completely unambitious. I love Scott Snyder's one quote during his tenure on Batman. He mentioned that he could give you a classic Scarecrow story. You know, he fear toxins the city, Batman fights his greatest fear. Turns out the whole thing was him actually punching Scarecrow at the end of the day. He could give you a classic Mr. Freeze story. You know, he tries to bring his wife back from the dead, somebody even more evil stops, and Batman locks him up in Arkham. But you've seen it all before. I mean, the New 52 Dark Knight series is basically this to a T. It's not bad, it's just not exciting. Snyder would rather give you something that's never been done before. And I really immensely respect that, because the plot and Hitch's issues of Justice League are about just as interesting as the ad copy in them. In fact, I think there's a Snickers ad drawn by Ivan Reese that's basically as interesting as Hitch's run. And somehow, Hitch stayed on this book for 30 issues. Did you ever wonder what was going on with Mr. Oz, or The Return of Wally West, or The Three Joker story? Because Hitch sure fucking didn't. And after Hitch's tenure on Justice League, Christopher Priest took over the book, and his run was... weird, to say the least? I mean, I loved his run on Deathstroke, but he never really got to leave his mark on Justice League. I feel like Snyder was already set up to take over the book before Priest was even put on Justice League. So after about three years of Justice League books that were about as interesting as Duke Thomas's character, Snyder drops Dark Knight's medal and rides the success to the Justice League book. All right, and for those of you guys who like Duke Thomas out there, I'm not saying he's a bad character. I'm just saying that he's Brian Hitch Justice League level good. Now in between, if you squint really closely in between Dark Knight's medal and Snyder's Justice League, you'll find no justice which Snyder actually named based off of what readers would get out of it. No Justice is like reading a lease that's spray-painted neon. Like, before you actually get to live in the house, you have to read all this other shit in terms of service, and that's what No Justice is. It's Snyder moving characters around so his Justice League would make any bit of sense. Like, yeah, I like seeing Beast Boy and Zatanna and Sinestro, but I'd really prefer if they were in an actual story instead of just moving from point A to point B. Basically, after the source wall cracked open at the end of Dark Knight's Metal, these Omega Titans or whatever have arised and they're going to destroy Brainiac's homeworld. So Brainiac contacts a whole bunch of heroes and villains to save Kolo or something like that. So the team goes and saves Kolo, but then it turns out that Brainiac is evil, so he ends up dying. But the big thing to take away from No Justice is that Lex Luthor is now a villain again. And his reasoning is piss poor. I've got a whole video talking about Luther's time as a hero, it was a great idea, but Snyder needs him to be a villain. So he is. And he needs Brainiac dead. So he is. And he needs the Tree of Life set up for Justice League Dark. Gosh, this book is like monetizing a pitch meeting for your new line of books. And did Lex become a villain again because he can't trust Superman, or because he was put at odds with the rest of the League, or because he's forced to make an interesting choice, or any decision for that matter? No, he just believes that entropy is the life force of the universe or something. But go cool off, Lex. We'll get to you eventually. So naturally, after the near death of the universe in Metal, and then the near death of the universe in No Justice, it's time to cool off and enjoy a nice, relaxing Justice League story. Absolutely fucking not. Snyder is doing a complete 180 of Hitch's Justice League. Everything is big, everything tops everything else, and we're not stopping for 40 issues. So buckle up tight, everyone. All right, so how's he starting this thing? All right, we got Justice League 1 million, the Monitor, Commandy, the Quintessence. We are four panels into this thing, and we've already touched like 20 corners of the DC universe. And that is my absolute favorite thing about this book, is it brings everything together. If you're a continuity fan who loved metal because it tied together a whole bunch of DC concepts, you're gonna love this too. Snyder takes all this DC history and brings it together like no one else has done before. And I think the quote that summarizes what this run is about is in the very first issue. When the League voted on which hero's costumes would be displayed in the entryway to the Hall of Justice, the vote was quick. Wonder Woman simply mentioned, we include everyone. And that's what this book is about. Everything's on the table. All these isolated quarters of the DC Universe, we're bringing all those together. And no matter how weird and confusing this book gets as it continues on, this is still the core of the book for me, the reason why it's so appealing. So let's jump back into the story. We start with the Justice League holding off an invasion from a group of Neanderthals. 
who the League loosely believes are being controlled by Vandal Savage. But they have no idea why Vandal would be attacking the Earth this way. The attack seems really premature. This invasion seemed like it was planned for hundreds of years from now. And it turns out that's exactly right. Cut over to Vandal discussing the invasion with his leaders of his tribes. It seems there's this powerful artifact on a crash course with Earth, and Vandal plans to move the Earth out of the way. He knows what this artifact can do, and he fears its incredible power. So after the Justice League defeat Vandal's minions, they have to make a decision. Are they going to stop the artifact known as the Totality from reaching Earth, or are they going to let it crash into Earth and see what the fuck happens? It could be some kind of message from beyond the Source Wall, guiding the League on a path to justice. Or it could be a weapon of immense power. I mean, who knows? They don't know, so they have to make a leap of faith. The League decides to let the Totality crash onto Earth, which means that they have to blow up the moon in the process. Yeah, we'll get to that. It turns out the Vandal and the League aren't the only ones who know about this cosmic space mineral, because Lex Luthor invades Vandal's evil lair. Now Lex Luthor is going to kill Vandal Savage in the scene, but, many of you might know, Vandal Savage is immortal. So let's all take a guess to see how Lex kills Vandal Savage. <laughs> If you picked A, you were wrong. If you picked B, you were wrong. If you picked C, you are wrong. And if you picked D, A, you're also wrong. The correct answer was Lex beats him to death with a doorknob. I, <laughs> I'm not kidding. This book is basically like a grown up version of Super Friends or Justice League the Animated Series. In fact, Snyder bases League lineup off the animated series. We got Martian Manhunter back, we have Hawk Girl, we even have John Later Green Stewart, despite the fact he's certainly the most boring Earth Lantern out there. And in keeping with this whole Super Friends thing, Lex invites a group of friends over to Vandal's hideout. A Legion of sorts. Now it's the Legion of Doom. You see, Vandal lost because he tried starting another Injustice gang. He chose Justice, when he should have chosen Doom. And presenting this year's Legion lineup, it's Black Manta. He really hates Aquaman, and this is his only character trait. Gorilla Grodd, he's the only sentient gorilla supervillain in the DC Universe. Now, just kidding, there's four of those. But he's the only sentient gorilla supervillain with psychic abilities. Actually, there's two of those. Look, uh, he's really strong, okay? I'm sure there's a good reason why he's on this team. Maybe? Sinestro, archaeologist turned Green Lantern, turned Dictator, turned Supervillain, turned Yellow Lantern, turned Avatar of Fear, turned Outcast, turned Dictator again, turned Outcast again, turned Cheetah. She's part woman, part Cheetah. He's here because they needed a Wonder Woman villain to round out the team. Sorry to any of the interesting ones. The Joker, he's funny and he kills people. And he has a really weird subculture, you know him. And of course, their valiant leader, Lex Luthor, because he's a bad guy now. I actually really love the Legion's inclusion here. Snyder sets up this run to be about justice versus doom. Justice is all about rising up and being better than who you are. It's embracing ideals and morals that make us better off as a society. And the original meaning of doom was fate. So the Legion are embracing their human impulses. They believe that there is no need to cling to these stupid ideals, and the true meaning of things lie inwards. When you're happy, celebrate. When you're angry, get into a fight. Don't worry about the consequences, just follow your instincts. At least that's what Lex believes. All these other villains really just want to kill their respective heroes, and even though this conflict gets contradicted or just blatantly ignored many times throughout this run, the idea is still really amazing. Remember, Snyder is great with pitches and ideas, and I love that each side of the conflict is given their own motivation. It's not just good versus evil, it's justice versus doom and it sets up a really interesting conflict moving forward. And there's just so many great things going on in this first issue. I love the third person narration in this book. It gives the series this larger than life feel like we're watching this crazy bit of modern day mythology unfold, which makes sense considering Snyder was heavily inspired by Grant Morrison's JLA, who actually bases heroes off the Greek pantheon of gods. This whole book just feels important. After a fuck all number of hitch fight fests, there's actual stakes to this story. There's an important conflict that's going on that includes the entirety of the DC Universe. And even though I hate how Snyder turned Lex into a villain for the sake of the story, I do love Lex's character here. Now that opinion will change within the next few issues, but again, concept's awesome. Lex couldn't be more happy about conquering the universe. After moping around, after losing to Superman all this time, now he's genuinely happy to have the multiverse in the palm of his hand. As Lex mentions in this issue, what's coming is horrible, and he can't fucking wait for it. Lex fully embracing his most evil impulses is a pleasure to watch. He's having fun with being a villain, and that's just a great take on the character that brings a lot of energy to the table. And with that, Snyder's Justice League is off to an exciting start. So let's jump into the rest of this first story in this run, The Totality. So the Totality lands on Earth, and now the Justice League has to go investigate it. Problem is, the Totality is really, really powerful, so most of the leaders can't even get close to it. The only people who can withstand the Totality are Superman and Martian Manhunter. So Batman uses Ray Palmer's shrinking technology to insert himself into Superman's bloodstream and insert Hawkgirl into Martian Manhunter's bloodstream, 
so that they can fight off the Totality's virus as the two move throughout the Totality. So already, the story makes minimal amounts of sense. And while the League does their thing, the Legion are 30,000 Leagues under the sea discussing their evil plans. You see, the Totality is this compass that helps you find the seven hidden forces of the universe. At least, I think it is? Because the League is going to examine the Totality, but in this scene, Lex is currently holding the Totality. When people say the ideas in this run are confusing, I tend to disagree. The problem is that nothing is well defined or explained. So everything individually makes sense, but I just have no idea what is what. But what I do know is that once the source wall is broken in metal, these seven forces are now able to be unlocked. So Lex tasks Grodd with harnessing one of these forces, the Still Force, which is apparently harvested from a baby version of the turtle. So Grodd gets to comically carry around his baby on his chest, which is just... Awesome. And Lex dispatches Sinestro to find the Ultraviolet Spectrum. And then Cheetah and Mana go off and they try to find another couple forces. Now villain team-ups can never actually end in any of these characters working together, so Cheetah claws Lex to death. But it turns out this was a Lex bot and the real Lex Luthor is currently in Superman's bloodstream. And the Joker's chilling in John's body. Now let's check in on the other John, the Green Lantern one. Batman's trying to recruit him into the Justice League, but John can't join because of one of his three character traits. That's right ladies and gentlemen, John Stewart has three character traits. He is an architect, he is a soldier, and he killed the planet of Zanchi. Any other character trait Snyder is not concerned about. So John doesn't want to join the League because he killed Zanchi, alright. But Batman isn't the only one trying to recruit John because Sinestro bursts into a ship and recruits him into his new Lantern Corps, harnessing the power of the second secret force of the universe, the Ultraviolet Lantern Corps. And this core feeds on the emotions of the wearer or something. Not sure, but it doesn't really matter because we're never going to deal with the Ultraviolet Corps after this arc. So Sinestro sends a brainwashed Jon Stewart to take down the Justice League. And if you're sitting there thinking to yourself that there's a lot going on right now, you're right. And it gets worse. So the League fights Ultraviolet Jon Stewart until they cure him while Superman and Martian Manhunter teleport to the Source Wall at the edge of the universe, until the Joker and Lex Luthor sneak up on Hawkgirl and Batman in order to take control of their bodies. But not before Jon reveals what he was doing during the events of Dark Knight Metal, because this book needs more exposition. He was investigating things on Thanagar Prime by talking to the Keep, who is the bearer of all knowledge of all the Martians, where he found out that he was abducted as a child and taken to Earth. You see, Wonder Woman, Aquaman, and the Flash investigate the secret underwater Legion of Doom base, only to find a secret conspiracy involving the White Martians, until the Legion shows up and absorbs the Flash's speed power to the Still Force. But wait, because Sinestro again takes control of Jon Stewart by destroying his ring and summoning the sentient galaxy of Umbrax to consume the world, turning all of Earth into members of the Ultraviolet Core. Until Superman launches Jon Stewart and the Flash mobile at the center of the universe until the entire Earth becomes a singular white lantern. But wait, because the Flash needs to sit as still as he ever has before in order to slow down the world and defeat Umbrax and capture the totality and seal it in the Hall of Justice, and Batman exclaims that we justice harder. <clears throat> Until Starman bursts into the Hall of Justice and declares three members of the League must die in order to win. Whew. Now, I know that sounds like three different story arcs going on at the same time, but that was actually just six issues worth of content. Well, the story starts off strong, it gets less and less grounded as it continues. Like, there are three separate conflicts going on at once, and they just don't make any sense. Like, okay, the Legion's goal is to capture these seven forces of the universe. So they can, what, rule the world? But were they gonna just, like, let Umbrax kill Earth? Like, what the hell do these guys want? Are they trying to kill the world, rule it? Because they really don't seem to care either way. And I think if one thing epitomizes this whole story, let alone run, it's that the entire Earth becomes a white lantern, and it just doesn't matter. Like, in the very next issue, it's just completely dropped as a plot point. And that's what this book is. It presents super interesting and impactful concepts, and then does nothing with them. The Ultraviolet Core, never seen again. Still Force, barely used. If you're not going to acknowledge that the Earth just became a white lantern, then what's the point in really doing it? But even if this book is incomprehensible, it's still really, really fun. Snyder completely changes his Batman from his Batman run. The Batman in Justice League is constantly cracking jokes. And while it's nice to see this fun-loving side of Batman, it's almost too jokey at points. Like, there's this whole Force segment about how characters try to impersonate Batman while they're stopping a massive world-ending threat. It's a little jarring. But I do think that the tone fits for this fun adventure story. The run really feels like a revamped Golden Age story. The villains are overly evil, the concepts are over the top, and it's just fun to read. But before I jump into our next arc, there was an interlude. You see, every five or so issues, Snyder hands the writing reins over to his protege, James Tinian IV, and focuses on what's going on with the Legion of Doom. So, it's time to check in on the Legion of Doom. In this first Legion of Doom interlude, we see Lex as he recruits Sinestro and Grodd into his team. In keeping with the non-stop continuity references, we get cameos to Scarecrow, Black Adam, the Residents of Hell, Apocalypse, all these different characters in this issue. Now let me stop explaining the plot of this book, and instead describe in detail the process of how to build an Ikea table stand. 
First, you have to make sure you have the tools for the job. Then once you have all your tools, you gotta separate everything into piles. You see how this segment could distract you from the video? Yeah, well, this is one of Snyder's favorite writing techniques. He stops telling you the story in order to explain some history of some artifact or architecture of some building. And by the end of his description, he'll always tie how that very specific object is a metaphor for the current story. <clears throat> I'm gonna kill you, Superman. Not today, Lex. Well, I guess this is... The Metropolis Glove Making Factory was built in 1895. For years, it was used as your average glove making factory, shipping gloves to areas all around the country. But during the Great Depression in the 1930s, part of the factory was burnt down, and it was rebuilt into something much darker. A billionaire tycoon restored the factory, but lowered standards. Workers were paid less. Safety precautions were nearly all removed, and hundreds died making those cheap plastic gloves. Exhausted after the Second World War, one brave employee stood up and challenged this tycoon. He organized strikes and petitioned to form a union. The tycoon took notice of this man, and one day, that worker did not show up to work. After two days, the workers started getting disappointed. And after a week, they started getting worried. And after the second week, the police checked his home and found the worker in his bed with a plastic glove covering his head. You see, sometimes, the good guys don't always win. It's actually pretty comical at times. Like, Snyder can't just help his obsession with architecture and history, but he's getting better at it. It was really, really bad in his Batman run. After Lex joined Team Entropy during No Justice, he realized that his entire life as a hero was meaningless, and he wanted to learn what the real secret to the universe is. So he traveled to the future where he learned about Lexor City. You see, in the future, the entire world worshipped Lex because he was the one person in the Age of Heroes who embraced Doom. But he was never able to win. The people of the future realized this tragedy of Lex's life and shaped their entire culture around him. Seeing this made Lex want to achieve victory in his lifetime, so he goes on a quest to recruit his legion and unlock the secrets of the universe. I really love seeing the continuity in this issue. We still see Sornik in charge of the Sinestro Corps. We see Grodd trying to take over the UN. It's just outright fun villainy. But by this point in the run, it's pretty clear that Snyder and Tinian do not have a good voice for Lex Luthor. He is just not sly or smart at all. If you look at Jeff John's Lex Luthor, you see this difference night and day. His Luthor is cunning and always 12 steps ahead. This Lex just lacks that silver tongue that he's known for. I don't know how he convinces any of these guys to join the Legion of Doom. He just kind of insults them and then they eventually go, hmm, tell me more. But hey, overall, this first story was a great start. It's confusing, but it's fun as hell and full of great continuity. But before we jump into that, it's time to check in on the Legion of Doom. First off, we get a flashback to Luther traveling back in time to kill Starman. But luckily, he escapes and jumps into the Hall of Justice in the present. In the present, Lex travels to the depths of his hidden lair to find his secret prisoner, the Batman Who Laughs. And the Batman Who Laughs is only there because he wants to be, because he's Batman and can escape whenever he wants, or something like that. Now, Joker really hates the Batman Who Laughs, so he doesn't want Lex talking to him at all. But because Lex is such a fucking idiot, he just ignores Joker and talks to him anyway. What happened to the Lex who always let Joker play at the end of Infinite Crisis? But Gimp Man tells Lex that if he unlocks all the secret forces of the universe, he'll unlock Perpetua, the secret mother of the universe. Cool. Good for you, Lex. While those two chatted up, Black Manta and Cheetah just actually kill Poseidon, the god of the sea. And that's our checkup on the Legion of Doom. Now, remember when the Justice League blew up the moon in the first issue? I guess they figured now would be a good time to deal with it. Like, did the absence of the moon not affect the tides or the disparity between night and day? Again, all these giant events are given no weight. But while Superman's off repairing the moon, we get this just wonderful tour of the Hall of Justice. We get to see each of the Leaguer's rooms. Green Lanterns is just an efficient space he can pack up whenever he needs to. Hawkgirl keeps a trophy room, and Batman has a giant steel door with a get out sign on it outside. It's the little moments like this that make you really just fall in love with this run. Again, there is so much wrong with this run. But when you get to see the entire league eating in the mess hall, or Wonder Woman and Aquaman talking about what kind of domain Diana should make for herself, you can't help but love this series. And of course, you have to give it up for Jim Chung and Jorge Jimenez on art. Chung is basically John Romita Jr. if he was good, and Jorge Jimenez is easily my favorite new DC artist in a long time. Besides, like, Dan Mora. Please follow this guy on Instagram, he's phenomenal. But Jimenez's pencils are the perfect fit for showing action. His exaggerated lines gives his character such a fluid motion to them. I think more than anything, Jimenez captures speed and movement so well. His characters are super dynamic and completely work in this over-the-top Justice League book. But sorry, Jim and Jorge, because Manipul and Porter are taking over art duties for our second arc in this run. It's time for Drowned Earth. So at the end of the totality, John, John, and Hawkgirl all fly away to Thanagar Prime to learn more about the Keep and how it relates to the Seven New Forces. So while those heavy hitters are away, the League investigates several new complications. Batman and his broken bones uses Jaro to recover Starman's memories. Oh, and yes, how could I have forgotten? In No Justice, former villain Starro sacrifices himself in order to save the multiverse. But Batman kept a piece of the psychic starfish, who is now regenerating and becomes Jaro. A teeny tiny widow Starro that's super adorable and aw, oh, look at him. 
Like, sure, this Lex sucks, but like, Jaro, come on. Also, Arthur and Diana team up to investigate the death of Poseidon by traveling to the grave of Arion, the greatest hero Atlantis ever knew. I love seeing these two team up. They really didn't get any quality time together until an annual in Parker's Aquaman run, but they're just such a perfect pairing. They're both from these ancient worlds tasked with being leaders in the present, and now they're together to see why Poseidon called them to Arion's tomb. You see, Arion banished a brigade of evil seed gods early on in Atlantis' history. And what's that? Oh, they're back. Manta and Cheetah bring these sea gods back from another dimension to wreak havoc on Earth, and more specifically, drown the Earth. Get it? Drowned Earth? And look, this book came out about right at the time when the Aquaman movie was released. So there was this big push to make Aquaman as badass as possible. So everything in this story is just metal as hell. I mean, the way these sea gods drown the Earth is by unleashing a giant space kraken that pukes black hole water that turns everyone it touches into a sea monster. Shit's nuts. Now let me explain to you what you need to pick up in order to read this whole event. First, there's the prelude, which is Justice League issue 10. Then there's the one shot named Justice League slash Aquaman special number one. Then there's Justice League 11, 12, and then there's Aquaman slash Justice League special number one. Could they not have given these one shots any names that were more reasonable? I j just pick up the trade because the reading order just doesn't make any sense. So anyway, the earth is fucking drowning and holy Christ, look at these pencils. I don't understand how you could be sharing art duties with Francis Manipal and your art rivals his. Porter's pencils are seriously insane in this issue. A lot of artists fall off as they grow old in their careers, but Porter just keeps improving and evolving. His artwork in this issue does a great job at capturing scale. He really pulls off this whole otherworld invasion thing going on. And Cider again flexes his continuity knowledge. He brings in Mera, Ocean Master, and all these other Aquaman concepts. And most of them are pretty great. Except for Snyder's Black Manta. Christ, can Snyder not make any of the villains in this run worth reading about? I mean, how? Does anyone remember Court of Owls or Death of the Family? Snyder knows how to write great villains, but all these dudes are weak. I'm sure it's somewhat intentional, but the villain dialogue in the series is what you'd expect a six-year-old to give on one of his action figures. Manta's defining trait is supposed to be hatred. He hates Aquaman for killing his dad. But Black Manta in this story cracks as many jokes as Batman in this series. And if Batman is the character in your book cracking the most jokes, you know something's messed up. Like, look at this dialogue. It's just weak. Manta is not taking any of this shit seriously. I think the only reason Snyder characterizes Manta like a Team Rocket admin is so he can have him beg to say, release the death kraken at the climax of the story. Like, even though this isn't something Manta would ever say, it's pretty fucking awesome. So while the League tries to save the Earth from this HM waterfall, the Legion of Doom invades the Hall of Justice to seal the totality. And the only person left guarding the Hall of Justice is Batman. And Jaro. So now Batman has to take down all the Legion of Doom by himself. Now, if this sounds familiar, because it was done way better in JSA number 10 when the Injustice Society invades the JSA headquarters while Wildcat is taking a bath. The difference is that in the Justice Society issue, they actually show the fight between Wildcat and the villains. With Batman versus the LOD, he just kind of beats them up off page, but they still manage to escape with the totality somehow. And also, what the hell even is a force anymore? Okay, so we have the Still Force and we have the Ultraviolet Spectrum. Got that. But at some point, Luther mentions, Two more hidden forces of the universe have been unlocked. Well, which fucking ones, Lex? You have the Tear of Extinction that Cheetah used to kill Poseidon. You have Arion's Conch, which better not be a force because that would be lame as hell. You have the Graveyard of the Gods. Then you have this key to the Graveyard of the Gods. Can we please sit down for a second and talk about what these forces are? Don't stop the book to talk to me about architecture. Stop the book and tell me what the hell is going on. I have a video where I talk about how Jeff Johns uses different artifacts and factions to enhance stories, but the whole point is that he clearly defined which each one was. Here it's like, well here's 50 different concepts, try and logically argue which seven fit the best as the different forces. And again, are the Legion trying to drown the entire Earth? What happens if the Justice League doesn't stop the Sea Gods? Do the Legion just want the Earth to die? Was the whole purpose of this event to steal back the Totality? Is the Totality one of the Seven Forces? Like, if Aquaman just doesn't stop the Sea Gods, the whole multiverse is just dead. What is the fucking plan here, guys? But it doesn't matter because Aquaman flings Atlantis at the bad guys to save the day. But not without Manta going mad with power and betraying the Legion of Doom. Great, it only took two stories for the villainous team to break up. Can we just have one villainous team where they all cooperate and want the same thing? In the end, Aquaman risks his life to save the Sea Gods because it turns out that the Sea Gods were good guys that Arion defeated because Poseidon told him to. Aquaman gets washed away on some beach without his memories, and this whole story of a historical legend being a lie to protect the world from a darker truth is a parallel to something we're going to see in a little bit. But first, the Legion is looking to recruit new members after the excommunicado of Black Manta. But none of that matters because Joker crashes the party because Lex disobeyed his orders and talked to the Batman who laughs. Like, what did you think was going to happen, Lex? There's just a lot of talking in this issue and it ends with Joker leaving the Legion. 
So now they're down two members, so Lex rebuilds Brainiac to become the newest member of the team. Definitely not as interesting as Joker or Black Mana, but hey, at least the team is in 25% Cheetah now. And that's where we end our first two stories. So to recap, the world nearly died in No Justice, and that was after the world nearly died in Metal, but before the world nearly died in the Totality, and then the world nearly died in Drowned Earth. There was like a single breather issue in there somewhere, but geez, Snyder really tries to increase the scope of his story with every arc, which would be fine if the first story scope wasn't death of the entire multiverse. So yes, I love this run, and it's a blast to read. And these first two stories are super fun Justice League action. They bring the DC universe together, they celebrate DC's continuity, and they take all these toys out of the DC toy chest and just have them battle. But wow, it's exhausting. And guys, if you thought Umbrax brainwashing the entire planet or the sea gods drowning the entire earth was a big enough scope, you haven't seen anything yet. Hey guys, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. You can follow me on Twitter at InfinityIncom1, and let me know how you feel about Scott Snyder's Justice League in the comments below. And I'll see you guys next time.